welcome to this evening's in conversation on the theme of uh, education for life efl also known as efl my name is brahmachari aditya and i am uh, sharing from ananda sangha pune and with me today are naya swami jaya ji who is the spiritual co director of ananda sangha's work in india and aryan mcsweeney who is the co director for education for life in india and uh, they'll be having this conversation inviting questions about what is education for life why do we need that and i'd like to just share a few lines about how education you might say for life came to be it started with paramhans yogananda ji he may not have directly used you might say that phrase but his keen interest in all rounded education is known to all who have read his book autobiography of a yogi before he became well known as a yoga master worldwide he was an educator a teacher the principal uh you know the parent you might say to the children in his school in rachi prior to that uh, briefly in dihika in bengal and in his time he met the great educators of that time like rabindranath tagore mahatma gandhi the great scientist jc bose and he took best principles he shared with them his own ideals on education and that goes to show how close it was to his heart the you know reform required in education system yogananda ji's disciple swami kriyananda took this movement forward in 1972 by starting a school on these principles in california and from there on he oversaw the starting of many such schools now aryan was born in palo alto in our community there ananda sangha palo alto went to that school where his father has taught for a couple decades now and uh, became one of our main teachers in the high school at ananda village california and today he's dividing his time between delhi new delhi and mumbai he stays in mumbai and in new delhi he's overseeing Uh, a school which is trying to incorporate the principles of education for life into their curriculum and jaya ji of course saw the start and the movement of ananda itself and the schools over there his daughter went to the first school that was started at ananda village and we know and appreciate your enthusiasm jaya ji behind education for life so i'd like to hand it over to you now jaya ji to take this conversation forward with one last comment for everybody who's attending that we are inviting questions towards the end so if you have any questions related uh, to this movement of education please do write it in the chat section and we will try our best to come back to them towards the end of the program thank you welcome to you jaya ji and aryan thank you know thank you thank you aditya and thank you very much to aryan for joining us today to have uh, a conversation because he's a proponent of education for life and as Aditya explained he's been the he's been the subject of education for life from all different perspectives and we're going to have a little conversation and I'm going to ask some questions of him and we're going to get his perspective from all those different angles I hope and so this is an informal gathering and we'll just explore this topic together and uh I'll ask some questions and I suspect he might have a question or two for me as well and so let's start off picking up where uh Aditya left off as we know master uh started schools and it was in, it was in that warehouse in that school in Ranchi where he had this vision of all of these disciples and he said those are americans and it was a call that he should start his worldwide mission but he had a very important mission there with education itself and it's very interesting how he he started with that and it was something that was very important to him and but his mission was so vast and so large that as swami kriyananda said about master he says his ideas were seminal in other words they weren't always things that he personally himself could bring into manifestation and as any great master does he leaves much of his work to his disciples and so some of these things were passed on and swami kriyananda picked up on certain elements of that as you know he picked up on the element of starting communities and very integral in that perspective of a community is starting a school and what the school means but swamiji was thinking 
more beyond school, he was thinking of educational principles at large, looking at today's education, what perhaps are we all satisfied with what education is on a national scale, what the modern view of how we go about it. So I want to get a little perspective. And so I know some of you may be new to these concepts. And so I thought let's start out with a basic, a few basic ideas. Uh, for especially for those listeners today who may be new new to this. And Ariva, can you briefly, and I guess we do have to be brief here <laughs> in our <laughs> what we're going today. And I can be, I sometimes forget that myself. Can you briefly summarize uh, some of the basic principles of education for life? And then we'll take it once we have a little bit of foundation. Uh, you know, what's the goal? You know, uh, what does it try to instill in children? Those sorts of things. I'll give it over to you. What do you think? Well, that's a great big question and uh, very appropriate that we try to make it a brief answer because it's one of those things that's education is foundational to everything, to our entire lives. I mean, we talk about education in school. Many of the things we learn there are to prepare us for our lives ahead. We learn how to have the skills that will help us to get a good job, to have you know, a successful life in a material sense. And really, if you wanna just summarize education for life, how it's different in one, one core way, it would be the definition of success in life. And so if we look at success in life as just that, being able to make enough money that you live a, a, a physically comfortable life, then the current system works well for some people, at least. We can say the first top 15, 20% of students who go through that system do very well with it. They get, they get good grades, they study hard, they get to the right college, they get the right job and all of that. The problem comes when we become adults, and sometimes this happens even as children, and we realize this is not, this does not feel like the success I was promised. I now have all the money. I now have this great job. I'm, I'm now making, I've got a great car. I've got a beautiful flat or house, whatever it is, but I'm, I'm missing something. And for those of us who are on, you know, a spiritual path, obviously we've talked about how Yogananda was the initial impetus for this movement, we could say this super conscious education movement in our times. Um, but he was really tapping into something that is just foundational in human beings, which is we have a deep latent desire to be to have inner deeper fulfillment to really you could say you could define it as happiness. And when you pick up education from that thread, it doesn't always even look drastically different. Maybe you're still studying science and English and maths and everything else that you study in school. But when the underlying motivation behind it is that we are trying to become happy, fulfilled adults, that shifts the whole calculus of how a teacher approaches the classroom, how the parent approaches the child's education, and how the child experiences their education. And it's, it's a beautiful shift and it takes place in many different forms. You know, there's many tools we use in education for life, uh, flow learning, progressive development, th all these different things. But at the core, all of those tools are only so that we can help each individual child become who they were born to become not who we might think they should become, not who society says they should become, but actually the individual child in front of us. What is the best life that this child can live and how can I prepare them for that? And so that involves all sorts of things like learning about life skills, like courage and kindness and sharing, compassion, looking through history and seeing where those things have come in and manifested and given the people who practice them success. Because the, at the core of this, Yogananda's teaching on this was very practical. It was, if you teach people how to live, in fact, that's how he called his schools, how to live schools, which is a wonderful phrase. Um, and you can see where education for life and how to live are very much tied together. If you teach people how to live, they'll be able to face any challenge. They'll be able to overcome whatever tests they face. And that's, that's sort of what education is supposed to do. But the problem is we don't always know 
what challenges they'll face. And so rather than trying to teach to every possible scenario, if you teach how to respond to difficulty, how to raise your energy, how to be courageous in difficult times, the child becomes an adult who knows how to do these things inherently. Well, that makes, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's so commonsensical, but let me just follow up. I know you're going to ask me something, but let me follow up on that question first before you go on. Many, you said, uh, as opposed to that 20, I imagine every parent thinks their kid's in that 20%. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> but uh, realistically, we know that there's a broad, broad spectrum. But this all sounds good, but I know many parents are always wor worried that, is it practical? You know, is, is my child going to fall behind? Is it, are they going to not be able to achieve, get into the school that they, is going to allow them to become, maybe they, they wanna be a rocket scientist or whatever, are they gonna be able to do that in this sort of an educational environment? So that's the, that's the parents. You know, absolutely. You know the question, you heard it. Everyone's <laughs> thinking it, you just said it, absolutely. <laughs> You know, it's, it's a funny thing that um, in my experience, sometimes we, in anything, in any line of work, in any experience in life, if we become too myopic, meaning just too focused on, on this very like fine point, we can sort of lose the, the bigger picture. And the bigger picture isn't just, oh, we want, you know, our children to be well-rounded human beings. So that means we have to take a few points away from the academics and redistribute them over there in their character. And we're going to make that sacrifice. Um, and on one hand, I think that there's, there's an argument to be made even for that being an okay choice. But let's say we don't want to sacrifice anything. The thing is that success in the workplace, let's say just looking at purely let's say we want to work at one of the best companies in the world we want to work at google we want to work at apple we want to work at tata we want to work at these big behemoth companies really successful known known in this in this sense for their success even they are recognizing that purely academically successful applicants are not are not actually going to translate into their bottom line it's become a very practical thing Google actually studied their whole workforce. They, they wanted to create an algorithm for hiring because they like algorithms for everything. And they went and studied their best performers, maybe some of their less good performers, their teams and all of these different things. And very long story short, they found that the top seven qualities that were a signal for whether uh, an employee was going to be a high performer at Google, the first seven of them were what sometimes we call soft skills or life skills. They are how to communicate, how to be a good a teammate, how to be a good leader, how to be a good employee as such, how to follow and sort of work as a cohesive whole, how to have emotional intelligence was one of the top ones. And only in number seven and eight do we start seeing, you know, do they have the technical skills to do it? So what I'd say when, when people naturally have that worry, that like if we sacrifice, if he goes, you know, my child goes down 10 points, 20 points in the test scores, you know, they'll lose out on this opportunity. They won't even get in the door. But what's happening is a global shift in understanding of what actually makes a successful employee, makes a successful teammate. And we see, I use Google, but actually one of uh, my classmates from school works at Google now and is very successful there. Um, and the list goes on in, in terms of the different successful companies in the world. Now, that's that's one thing. The other thing is our students regularly test in the top 10 percent nationally in tests that we do not prepare them for specifically at all. We prepare them in our classes. We prepare them by teaching. We prepare them by learning how to think critically, how, how to understand context, how to be able to understand what's happening in a larger sort of viewpoint. And so when our students go on, they actually do very, very well in their academic pursuits as well. They get into the finest, if it's secondary school, we have elementary schools in, in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. The students there get into the finest schools. They go on to fine colleges. They go on to get, you know, one of them is working on a PhD, I believe, in uh, one of the Ivy League schools right now. It's just 
there is the the idea of a trade-off if if done correctly if done with the right approach isn't actually there it's one of the the ironies is if we for a second allow ourselves to trust that a bigger picture is necessary we teach our children how to learn and when you know how to learn you can succeed in any environment many of those things that you're talking about are specifics and rather than addressing the specifics if they know how to learn those specifics they can do it at any time and they don't exactly. have to, they don't have to cram all that knowledge into their head and they memorize it all but I mean, you can always you can go to google and find out the information if you need it <laughs> 20 years ago nobody knew this was going to be a thing and now it's in every single person's pocket it's a multi-trillion dollar industry if we only prepare our students for what is happening now we leave the whole possibility of the future outside and then they get there and they only knew how to do the things that were now outdated I mean, things are moving too quickly to live that way. Exactly, exactly. Anyway. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you a question, if I may, oh, because, okay. Okay. you know, I came into the into the EFL uh, game, you could say, very young. I started in kindergarten and I didn't have <laughs> any context at the time for what EFL was. I just thought it was school. I'm going to school. I, you know, it's just the normal thing. What was it like, and now I have a better understanding, but still, what was it like you were in the community, you yeah. were seeing Swami Kriyananda develop these ideas in real time, you were seeing them put into practice by Nitai and others, you saw it happen with your own child. What was your experience in seeing that really taken from just an idea, ideational stage and actually put into practice? That's a very good question. And I think in a sense, it's a good question to think about because it, these things don't just happen once and that's it, because they happen again and again and again as we go through it. And we're in the same situation right now, you could say, in America and other parts of the country outside of the village where schools are trying to get uh, started and form a, formed. And we're seeing it also here in India, and it's, it's happening in Italy at the same time. And there's these certain elements that come that are somewhat universal uh, to starting schools. And like I said, Master's idea and Swami's idea were seminal. They personally had a mission that was more than being a school. They could not dedicate their life to being a principal of a school and, and that. And Master had to transcend uh, above that when he took on that world mission. But Swami played that role is that he inspired. He inspired people. He inspired others to take up the mantle. And I think that was the critical, one of the critical things. And he was on, he was looking for those people in which the seeds of those inspirations would be plant, could be planted and would flower. And of course, when in 1971, Nitai came to Ananda and he came to Ananda as a young, very young man. He had just graduated from college and he saw that there was a need. He had an interest in education. He saw that there was a need for a school. He talked to Swami. Swami encouraged him very much to, to take up the mantle. And we very much need a school here because this is a community and a community includes children. It's families, it's children. And of, of course you have to have a school in the, in the community. And so he started to implant the inspiration within Nittai, take it, take it. He didn't tell him what to do. He inspired, you might say, he worked through him to inspire his own idealism because the ideals that Master expressed are, they're quite common now. I think many people have these ideals and they were always there to some extent, but, but Nittai was very idealistic as a young man. And so what he did is he went back to school he went back to the, you know, you know, the school, he went to Davis to get his teaching degree because he wanted to fit into the legal system of having accredited school. So he went, got his teaching degree and he came back and he started that. Now, one of the, and I think the principle here is what Swami did is he inspired individuals to, who had these ideals in their own mind. And I think this is the challenge that we have in order to 
have this spread is to find those, plant those seeds in people that have idealism and to be able to take this forward. Now, Swami, when he was planting those seeds within Nittai to formulate them, uh, he, 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 he said, well, once he got, when they got growing, he realized he needed to say more. He needed, and so that's what led him, you could say, to writing this book, Education for Life, because he was just verbally communicating with Nittai. And so, but he said, oh, we need to, let's put this down. And basically what Nittai was doing and what Swami then gave a philosophical structure to it in this education for life. And it was then Nittai's job to take that out of the ether and translate it. Now, Nittai at first, but there's been a whole succession of wonderful teachers your dad included by the way and yeah. is to take these things and make them practical but that journey i like to say it's not at an end that journey is just beginning because society is changing circumstances are changing i think that's the beauty of the principles that swami uh, put out is he said this and he encouraged people this needs to be taken and expressed and developed further go deeper into it go deeper because we can't predict what's going to happen that was what how 40 years ago now or what it was now it's different it's now yeah and it has to go forward and so it was an effort as you could say but it was very dear to swamiji's heart because one of the things that he felt was his particular mission you might say Master came with all these ideas and he showed how the teachings of Kriya, the teachings of our masters, how they can be applied in family life, business life, educational life, and in all different ways that it's, we can't put it in a corner and just say it's philosophy or it's for the only for the individual. It's for transformation of consciousness in society. And that starts with the kids, in a sense, a new generation coming up and new ideas coming up and the old ones go and are replaced by the new ones. And so this was this has been very dear, very dear to uh, to Swami and to, as integral part of Ananda Sangha and what we're doing. But I'm going to come back at you with another one. He says, are you, you hinted and I, this is maybe on a little bit personal one, because sure. uh, I think, you know, you because you're a perfect example of you. You know, I had a daughter, I have a daughter, <laughs> and she was in, she was in school, and uh, I had the firsthand uh, view of her coming up in education for life. And I think you did mention one of the key ingredients that I felt made her successful in her adult life, and she's very successful, is that one you mentioned about emotional intelligence something that i see missing in the traditional school system is that emotional intelligence and i'm kind of i would like to get your perspective because you were immersed in it not as a parent only but as a but as a kid actually coming up you grew up in it and you intended it as school what was your perspective what's the, how did the kids i mean what did they think i mean it's because you know kids can be very uh you know they don't like to be different they want to be they want to fit in you know and they want to you know and they want to be part of the you know and but i saw the i saw the kids at ananda school when they graduated out of there they stood very firmly on their own two feet and i was very very impressed with all they came i don't know how they do that but uh <laughs> what was your perspective from the other side <laughs> how do they do that you know I, I, I grew up, you know, by the time I reached high school or secondary school, I had to shift out of an EFL school because at the time they only offered until uh, eighth grade, class eight there. And when I got to my next school, I was surprised. I was actually kind of afraid. I went from a very small school to a, it was, my class went from a two, I had one other eighth grader in my school to 400. Uh, in my cl class. And then there was four classes like that. So I was in like a small city, I felt like compared to where I was before. But what I found very interesting was how quickly I just felt like I was a part of it. 
that I, I just sort of saw the flow and just kind of jumped into the flow. But what you say is very interesting, which is I feel like I didn't identify with the flow. Like I was able to be in it, but I didn't feel like I was carried by it. And that is something you're right. You don't see a lot because peer pressure we hear all the time yes, is a very yes, real yes. thing, especially as children get to that age. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't at the time have the context to understand why I was different. I just assumed I was a bit different and I wasn't the only one. It wasn't like I was like just walking around glowing and everyone else was beneath, but I, I somehow understood how to work with people, how to make friends, how to, you know, by the end of my four years, I knew every single one of those 400 classmates. And I didn't set it as a mission, but at the end of senior year, I kind of realized, oh, I'm actually kind of at least like kind acquaintances with 400 people. Uh, that's kind of that's kind of interesting. And only later on realized that it had a lot to do with the school culture at Living Wisdom School in Education for Life. And one of the things I think that's most remarkable is how all of EFL is working with energy. What, what Master gave us is an understanding of how energy works. Not just that it exists, not that sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down, but how to raise it yourself and how to raise it, how create an environment that raises it for others. And one of the manifestations of that is how they approach conflict resolution. And it's, it, it has variations, but this is how I experienced it in the Palo Alto School. And it's very simple. You have the two people, the two children, they got into a fight because kids do and and adults do. <laughs> and the two children come together and the teacher comes in. Basically, the whole flow is one child says what they're feeling, what they felt happened and then how it made them feel. And then the other child is asked to basically repeat that to just sort of acknowledge the fact that they had this experience. You're not validating it. You're not saying you're right to have felt bad because maybe you didn't mean to hurt them. It doesn't mean that you have to take extra responsibility that wasn't there, but just, and then you sort of say what your perspective was and they kind of say back to you. And at the end, the teacher sort of says, do you feel like you can accept each other's perspectives? And like, what is it also that you're really wanting here? You both were having so much fun playing before. Is this more important than that? And nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, it resolves like that because the children were encouraged to just connect for a second about the thing, to not ignore it, to not sit in anger and stew there and kind of wrestle with it and go home upset and then get even more angry there. And then they lash out or do something, push over a pot, then their mom is mad at them. And this whole thing <laughs> cascades on for a week. It gets nipped in the butt because that's exactly what master taught us about energy. If you can catch it right at the beginning and just move it upward, it's nothing. You don't have to go through this whole detour. And through that process, you learn that compassion, that empathy are actually the most practical life skills you can have because they lead to your success. They lead to more harmony. They lead to more friendships. They lead to even you getting what you want, if you want to put it that way, mm -hmm. because everyone's harmonious. People share with you when you're harmonious. Yeah. And so it becomes not this thing like, oh, thou shalt be kind because, you know, it's what they say you should do. It becomes a living, breathing reality. And then you spend eight, nine years in that culture it changes you. It changes the, just the way that you interact with the world. And all of a sudden, you know, someone says something and it doesn't annoy you. Or if it annoys you, you're able to catch that and say, is me being annoyed about this going to help the situation? Is it going to get me anything that I want? If the answer is no, then I can let this go. And to me, that's emotional intelligence, being well, able to choose. What you say, I mean, when you went Let's say you graduated from your eight years with EFL school and you went to the public school. Did you, you know, one of the goals of EFL is this, I mentioned emotional intelligence, but also Swami makes an interesting point in his teachings that it's really about maturity. 
learning to be more mature, which means the ability to relate to the perspectives and the feelings of other people, to conclude other people in one's reality. And did you, did that ever, I mean, you probably didn't frame it in those terms, obviously, but did, did you notice that? Because I noticed when I spoke to my daughter and her friends of her generation, they said, yeah, some of the kids in the high school they went to, they seem so immature <laughs> compared, you know, to that they didn't learn some basic things along the way. And I don't know if you had that experience or not. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did. I had a student. I'll start with this. I had a student who had come through the EFL system all kindergarten through eighth grade, and she was really looking for a new experience, you know, because there was a high school at the Nanda village. And so but she was a little bit hesitant to just do it because she felt like, you know, maybe I've been here a long time. Maybe this isn't a challenge anymore. Maybe I've sort of I've got the system. I want to I want to be challenged. And so she went to the local public school, which was a fine school. It wasn't, you know, by any means a terrible school. But when she got there, she was shocked that so many of the children did not seem to have any understanding of other people. <laughs> but they didn't have an understanding of like basically one of the core aspects of like our life is defined in many cases by our interpersonal relationships and that was just completely missing yeah. and so she did a semester she got all a's just to see that she could she yeah. said it was the easiest classes she had ever done because in fact when you work on this level it's challenging you, the uh. teachers actually challenge you to grow it's it's something you can you can duck your head in in a lot of schools and just kind of slide by and never be challenged today so that was there um <laughs> i find that the the, the definition of maturity sonology gives as it's like you said the ability to relate to the realities of others is so practical it's something i never noticed for sure growing up it, sometimes people ask me what was it like going to an efl school did you know that they were working with your energy or did they use like terms like light and ego active and heavy never i was <laughs> never i never had any clue that i was in an efl school as such until later i look back and i was like oh helen was doing this dad was doing this you know they were working with my energy in that way um but it's also uh -huh. Like I said earlier, it, it's practical. Like you want, nobody wants to fight with people. Nobody wants to be disharmonious with their, their classmates or teammates and this and that. And some people think, okay, I'll just, when I'm an adult, I can just choose who I'm with. Uh -huh. But that's not really how it works. You get put on teams at work. You get, you know, just, you marry someone, now you're married to their family. Like there's constant opportunities. <laughs> for having to be able to understand where people are coming from. That's where the compassion actually comes from. It's not a blanket compassion, like I just beam compassion everywhere I go. You're compassionate because you understand where they're coming from. You can put yourself in their perspective. And that's, I mean, that's everything. That's the difference between, in my mind, and from what I've seen, a life that is truly successful, someone who, gets along with everyone who's able to build things, build great things because of how they're able to gather people to be magnetic and to put that out into the world. Um, it doesn't always look the same. Not everyone is destined to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but everyone is destined to be happy. And in EFL, we make sure that that is a prioritized part that we're not you know ever sacrificing that in 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 terms of anything else well i'm going to bring this down into the day-to-day -day level and uh you're now in delhi and uh well you're working up there and you're trying to instill something into a culture of educational culture that has its own momentum can you tell us a little bit of what you're trying to do and how's it going and what's happening there? Sure. <laughs> what's how's your it going? What's, what's your, you know, now how's it going? Maybe what your goals are and whether any of that is, you know, because I, I think about what you're doing and I think, my God. <laughs> <You know that? laughs> I mean, because you're, it's like trying to change a locomotive, you know, with, yeah. uh, with, you know, and just putting your hand out and pushing it on the side and it doesn't, 
That's really, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> trying to wind resistance on one side, right. seeing if it'll turn. <laughs> yeah. So what, what what's going on with all of that? I think people would be interested to know. Sure. Well, what's going on? I, I like to think of it, the locomotive is perhaps a more apt metaphor. I like to think of it as a massive ship turning at sea. If you have to take the Titanic, I wish I knew the name of a ship that didn't sink, but <laughs> if you take a massive ship and you try to, you're like, well, we have to turn right. That turn, because of the momentum, because of the size, because of just the physics of it, takes many miles sometimes, many kilometers to take this turn. And it doesn't, at times, probably doesn't look like it's turning at all. But that turn is slowly, slowly happening. And eventually, one day, banat banat banjai, you're now pointing 90 degrees this way, and you are going there. So this, this is, I'm going to start at the very macro level, but then bring it very quickly down to the practical, which was Master told us that we are in an ascending age. We're in Dwapara Yuga ascending. And that basically the, the, the Cliff Notes version, the shortened version of that is that the world is going to become more and more conscious. Every hundred years, every year, every minute, even. It's just slowly, slowly on an upward trajectory. And this idea, Education for Life, started in a time when it was very much the minority. I mean, in our area, it was probably the only uh, manifestation of its type. But right now, we're seeing a revolution, um, certainly in the West, but also, I'm sure, here in India, I've seen examples um, of that, of this idea that alongside the academics, we need to give attention to what's called SEL, social emotional learning. And in fact, that is now giving rise to an idea of mindfulness in schools. And there have been a number of very high profile, massive studies done that show the effectiveness of a simple meditation technique on schools, on uh, classrooms and on children, and actually on teachers as well. And so we're seeing this shift already start to happen. I think sometimes you don't know the ship is turning until it's already gone away. And then you look back and you're like, oh, we actually have been turning a little bit this whole time. And so this is the idea. So in Delhi, we're working with the CBSE school there that has its own you know, curriculum, its own approach. It's already moving in one direction. But there is this document that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, it's called the NEP, the National Education Policy, and they released a new one in 2020, the first one I think in more than 30 years, and it's supposed to set a cardinal direction for where education will go in India. And what it says, if you read it, it reads almost like a document that an EFL teacher would have written. It talks about the importance of a holistic approach, of an emotional, of emotional learning, of the importance of spiritual values taught in a universal way. So, I mean, this I, when I first read this, it actually kind of it blew my mind a little bit because I was actually very much also of the opinion like this is not going to work. We have to just keep focusing on on our pure EFL schools because and, and show the example so that others will eventually come to understand it through that. But I believe right now there's an opening and we will see because we're very much in the early stages of this opening. I'm actually set to make my first visit in November of whether we can introduce some of these ideas, some of these principles that we've tested over 50 years. We know work, we've seen it work. We know if you hand this to a teacher and they really grab onto it, that they will see a change very quickly. And if we can do that and then show the results, because an interesting thing about that meditation study, it showed they added it in one instance, they added it to the San Francisco school district. So that's a city of a million people. Um, so however many students that is, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. And they found that attendance went up, truancy went down, Detention went down, or disciplinary issues went down, but most interestingly for many people who say it's unpractical, test scores went up, grades went up, because when we understand our own energy, when we understand who we are, these things become child's play, and I mean that literally. It becomes very easy to succeed in that sense, when you can access peace that's inside, when you can access the calmness, the power of who it is you actually are, not this 
like small definition person who needs to look to others to be able to understand who they should be, but somebody who, without forcing it on anyone else, just is themselves. And we talk a lot about authenticity right now, but that's what we actually do, the real authenticity, which is like, who are you? And now, it works. Now, you, you don't yet have uh, the experience of the, the feedback yet, but it, is it true? I would, I would suspect your first job is to work with the teachers and to get buy-in from the teachers. So would that be, that be true? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, two tiers because as we know, you also eventually will need, and sometimes first you need buy-in from the parents. Ah, um, I do want to mention. <laughs> that's right. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about sure. that because the parents, you know, are either going to make or break to some degree. You know, because if they're supportive, uh, and they're and so they are playing. What role is do the parents play in education for life? Maybe that's the way we should phrase this. Do they play a role? And uh, <laughs> of course they do. I mean, I mean that's, what a, do. that's what parenting is all about. But yeah. let's say in taking it in the formal sense of education for life as a educational system, let's say it from that end. Sure. I mean, I think I have a, I have a lot of compassion for parents because they live in a world where all they're told is how competitive education is, how competitive the world is. They need to make sure their kids are doing well in these tests. They need to make sure. And even that the most well-intentioned parent is going to feel this pressure because everyone is saying that this is the reality. And so a lot of times it, and a proper EFL system has the, the support and the, it's a partnership between teacher and parent. We are together helping this child become who they're supposed to become. But it doesn't always happen right out of the gate. Certainly, I would actually be curious in your own case, you were a parent in an EFL school, but you probably already had a fair amount of buy-in because you knew the teachings that were underlying it and you trusted them with, I mean, probably everything. You probably didn't have a lot of, of uh, worry about that, or did you? Well, I think what it is, is I saw school as simply an extension of the family of what was going on in the family. You take, you know, that you walk the child to school as their little ones and you take them to school. And it was actually just exactly what you're saying. It's a partnership. And if if I felt it was absolutely essential to be involved, I went to so many things. I mean, I went to, <laughs> you know, if you're going to be involved, you, you be involved because your child is spending how many hours a day in this school and the influence that has been happening there. And so to insert yourself into the child's life, I, I see in parenting in general, I see oftentimes the people live, parents and kids live parallel lives that don't intersect. And mm -hmm. it's a bit sad. And they wonder why when that child gets to be a teenager that they've lost contact with them. They don't have a relationship. The relationship begins to fray because they haven't, you, you can't all of a sudden when they turn teenagers insert yourself into a situation where you've not been before. And so you have to buy in it. So I saw school as that opportunity to basically be a parent and, and uh, you know, take up the job of being a parent. And, and so consequently, you're just as you said, and I don't think this is unique to EFL schools, any good school will do this. You, you know, the parent teacher, you know, relationship, you're, you're an extension of that, but you, you try to cooperate and, and promote the same ideals, which by the way, I found that what the school was trying to promote in terms of what, let's say emotional maturity, well, that's what I wanted too for my child. I probably wanted for myself as well. <laughs> but but this is exactly what parenting is about, but on a little bit more uh, scientific or objection uh, objective manner of practical application. And so I think if we're going if parents are going to send kids to an education for life school, they need to they need to buy in. Of, mm -hmm. of what is going on and further that same, you know, like you were talking about concept re or conflict resolution between those kids, those principles can, you know, you have conflicts in parents, child and, and, and brother, sister, 
bringing those into the home in the same way. And so if, if you are educated in, in at least the basic concepts, it's absolutely critical. And that's, of course, what happened with at the village schools as it was expected that all the parents and not, I would not actually say this even further in a community setting. I was at another event the other night, the day and I mentioned this. I said the kids had lots of aunties and uncles because everybody, the whole community buys in to what's happening. And I noticed uh, in the public settings, kids that have been brought up, and it's not just in our schools, in the EFL schools, but in in home situations where the where the parents consciously were trying to instill these things, kids as they grow up were able to relate to adults, not just their parents, but other adults. And I've noticed that many kids growing up, they get to be a te teenager, they can't relate to other adults. They're shy, they're intimidated, they don't know what to say, they don't know how to carry on a conversation. And I noticed that the kids that had grown up in our schools, it was all Uncle Jaya, I guess, but they, but they, would, but they would, you could talk to them. And, uh, yeah. and, I, and I thought that was just such a wonderful thing. So the parents, I think, do play that role. So please carry on where, yeah. where you were going. Well, no, I, I found that very interesting. And and one of the things was sometimes what we say when we are talking about uh, talking to a prospective parent, you know, they're looking at the school, they're wondering about it. We say, wouldn't it be, I mean, well, let's actually just say, at our school, we care about your child as much as you do. Mm -hmm. And that I think is what really sets an EFL school apart is because EFL teachers, you become an EFL teacher because you really, it's not just that you love children, of course, that is a part of it, you, you enjoy that process and being around them and to teaching, but it's also, it's more, it's almost education for life, even for teachers who are not on the path, uh, on, on our specific path, or not disciples of Yogananda, it is a, something of a spiritual path for them. They, they, um, there's an understanding for EFL teachers that this is, this is like seva in the truest sense, and not just to their group, but it's, it's you're, you're serving the soul that's in front of you. And a parent has that connection already with their child. But sometimes when you go to a school, the teachers are not, maybe for whatever reason, they're not, they didn't come into the, into the industry for that, that purpose, they sort of fell into it, or they do like teaching, but the relationship with children is not quite there. And that's why one of the first things we do, speaking of how do we approach this in the school, is we focus on how to make that connection. It's something, we, a practice we call entering their world, entering the child's world. And we really emphasize what it means to really understand the child where they are at. So we're not just imposing our reality onto them, but we're understanding that they have a reality, that reality is valid. And the more that we understand it, the more that we ourselves are mature in that definition Swamiji gave, the more we're gonna be able to understand them. And then in time, we're then able to shift that into helping them to grow. And that's a training that I'd like to see offered to not only teachers, but to parents in our schools, in the schools that we work with, um, not because they necessarily, again, it's, it's never like a deficiency. It's just, here's an approach that will help. And I've seen over and over again in the trainings that I've been a part of in India, it's the immediate. I had a, a parent who connected with, you mentioned a teenager, they were able to connect with their teenager in a way they hadn't for a couple years as they had entered their teenage years. And it's just the, the trust that is created when you meet them on their level is the foundation of everything. It's how, it's how you create what we might call a safe space for learning. It's when they trust you, not just trust you that you, you, know, you know what you're doing, but trust that you have their best interest at heart, that they become an open, well, an open book. They just want to, they want to share, they want to understand, they want to learn. And that's, that's at home, that's in the school, that's all through life. Well, it's an interesting thing. Is I think what, what we are faced with, you and I and all of us here really, 
is how can we propagate this and how can, what can we do to get this out? And by the way, before I go on, uh, we do want to leave some time for your questions. So if you have questions, uh, Blasey, you can look for people's hands up. If, if people come with the hands up, you can interrupt us and say, we have a question. So, okay, so, <laughs> and uh, so that we, we do invite that. But our, you might say our challenge is what can we do to promote or spread these teachings out a little bit or get them into the mainstream? And I know you're doing wonderful work there, Delhi, and that's one step. Here down in Pune, I've always had this feeling that uh, uh, we need to get a few examples of, of school, of functioning schools that, or people, because you know, you hear this thing, well, this is all a very great idea. And now if we were in the USA, we could say, go, you know, go to the schools that we have, but we're not in the, <laughs> we're, we're here in, in uh, India. Oh, so I hear all the time, uh, the phrase also, that's great. That works in America, but it, it doesn't will it work, work in India. Will it work in India? This is the yeah. big question. And and I have great faith it will, and you do have great faith it will, but we have to somehow get some objective proof. And that's fair. That's fair. But nevertheless, nevertheless, we do have to. And I think in the ways that you're trying to integrate some of these principles in, I hope, you know, what with COVID comes to a bit of a soon actually maybe even within the next uh, few weeks a new term will start maybe we'll get our we're hoping to get our school started up and running physically again but also progress has been made online and to what degree can we do some of this online is that a possibility can <clears throat> afl be online and because that is you might say the situation we find ourselves in. We're going to proceed physically with the school, God willing, with uh, within Pune. We're gonna we're gonna make an uh, an ability, and then teachers can come and participate and train. But online is with us now, and it's going to go into the future. Do you have anything you might contribute on that end? Sure, and then and then I see Blazy's hand, and we can we can um, let uh, them break in. But I did want to say there is. I think that it's it's this you drill from the top and you also drill at the bottom and and eventually we'll meet in the middle actually like the railroad in the United States they built from the east coast and west coast and they met in the middle and I think that's what's happening now the highest manifestation of it is a pure EFL school and that is happening right now in Pune um it's it was very interesting I mean the, there was an open question can it happen online as such and I think the answer uh, as proved by the Pune school is yes, uh, we can, we also have an online high school uh, happening right now. I'm actually teaching a course of middle schoolers, um, preparing them to give them an experience of what it's like at an online high school. And we have students, many from India, we have a student uh, from Iran, from Uganda, from Italy, and they're all coming together into this one class and seeing the cultural exchange, seeing the idea exchange, is really powerful and seeing the trajectory of how this can build is really powerful but of course i'm very much also excited for the school to have a physical uh location because of course that does help to build magnetism even further um i did want to just mention i think it's been mentioned in the chat here uh, prish has been sharing some wonderful information just that if there are people out there right now who are feeling you know that this, they'd like to see this happen because the schools they don't happen on their own and right now it's an amazing core of devotee teachers or teacher devotees who are doing it but if if this is something that's interesting you should get in touch i, I see that uh, seema's email is there and and just see and explore because we do all of our trainings are available online and you can get quite a ways into even to the point where you're you're in a classroom environment just online wherever you are in india for now because this is an all hands on deck kind of situation it's it's a massive thing to try to i mean this is anand in a nutshell it's like a handful of people trying to change the direction of global consciousness and it's a beautiful thing it's actually it's 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 worthy of dedicating your life to which is why we all have um but efl is is another manifestation of that and it's it's um, in that sense, a lot of fun. So whether you feel inspired 
in from the pure EFL aspect or the drilling from below as, as I'm doing and others have done before me. Prisha and Gayatri have done a lot of work in this area before I came. Uh, it's, it's a big thing and there's lots of ways to contribute, to experience it and uh, to connect. So definitely I, I invite anyone interested to, to reach out to some of the people listed in the chat. So let's, let's take a question or two, Blazy. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Jayaji Aryan. This conversation has been so dynamic and lively. So I see uh, Supriya's hand raised, uh, but probably you've already answered some part of Somni's question, uh, who is asking what are the plans for EFL schools in India? How can we offer the gift of education based on EFL to the younger generation? So if you, uh, you yeah. Yeah, I just briefly want to answer that. Just a few sentences, which is all the first EFL schools sprung organically from the desire of a group of devotees to have their children educated in a higher consciousness way. And so what I would say is that's not the only model, but that model definitely works. And so if you're near a center, if you have other devotees, if you have children and you want to see something like this happen, the very best thing is either if you're able, if you're in Pune, that you have a school already, they do support online uh, students. And I believe they're looking towards a hybrid model, even as they come back in person. You can reach out to Seema or Prisha about that, but also look into starting a school. There is support. We have, you know, EFL trainers, Nitai, Irene, in, both in the US, myself to some degree. There are others, Prisha, of course. There's a network of people who want to see more people have these tools that in order to put them into practice. So a lot of times the best way to start is by starting. And so if you're in a city center and there's a group of you and you want to see this happen, let's make it happen. Yeah, I think you. Yeah, you bring up a very good uh, principle of if you want to see something happen, you can't wait for others to do it. You have to be a participant in making making the future uh, that you want to see uh, through your own efforts as well, participating in magnetism. People come together, and something happens. It does happen. So, Supriya, I think you're you uh, you were up uh, making you <laughs> un unmute. Yes, sir. I just didn't want Saloni's question to be left behind. She asked the first question of our chat, and may uh -huh. I present that to Arivan? She says, how to give a propelling energy to students at an early age so that they can learn with interest? Uh, there are many different approaches. I would say two that spring immediately to mind is one, Swamiji described the first years, depending on how early you're talking about, the first years of zero to six as being the body years meaning that we learn principally our ability to relate to the realities of others even comes from our physical interactions and so one thing i would do is make sure that they have opportunities to move that they're encouraged to move whether it's connected to learning or they're just playing games the body is an incredible tool in that way. We have many beautifully uplifting songs that we share in Education for Life, and we've added movements to a lot of them so that your whole being is involved in the process. And so, you know, I had a, a parent once say, you know, my child, he just won't sit still at school and he's not listening. He just wants to run around and play with his toys. And I was like, well, how old are they? And like, oh, five. And I was like, well, yeah. That's correct. That's, 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 that's how they should be. They're doing, they're, they're teaching us right now. And, and that was, the parent was really just looking for, they wanted to let them, you know, be that way, but they were afraid that they were, you know, not putting them on the path to success. So that's one thing. The other thing is always, and this applies to all ages, work with their interests. Work with the areas where the energy is already flowing. Find ways to connect their favorite show, their favorite characters, their favorite books, their favorite whatever it is into whatever it is you're trying to share. This is why stories are such a great way to share values because the children really love the characters, they identify with them. And then you can say, oh, look how they responded in this, in this situation. Maybe, you know, you can too. Maybe that's a, that's a good way to, to live your life. You wouldn't say it that way if they're five, but you know, you adapt the conversation appropriately, but with their interests, where, where they already, it's easy for them to move energy. 
Thank you, Aryan. Okay, so, uh, Supriyan, do you want to go first and then we okay. can take up Himat. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so um, I raise my hand not as for a question, but a comment because as someone who has taught both in the public school system in California and at an EFL school, which was up in Seattle, Washington. Um, and I just wanted to comment on the contrast from a teacher's perspective, because the thing that strikes me the most about the difference is the creativity and joy that is um, imbued in a living wisdom school as opposed to public school. And uh, case in point was at the end of one particular school year, I taught mostly fifth graders, which is about 10, 11 year olds. And I asked what they were most looking forward to uh, at the end of the school year going into summer. And one little boy stood up and said, being released from prison. <laughs> and that was their perspective <laughs> on what school was like for them. And the whole class stood up and applauded him. <laughs> and my oh, no. heart sank in my chest. Yeah, it was it was devastating. And that was at the point I decided I was taking an early retirement <laughs> teaching in the public school system. Um, and by contrast, you know, the one year that I did teach in, in the Seattle school, you know, the children wanted to be there. There was so much creativity. There was so much joy. There was so much fun. There was so much engagement. And consequently as a teacher you know i wanted to be there because it brought me so much joy and it was so great to be able to be creative uh with the children and have fun myself and that was definitely not my experience in the public school system and the other comment i wanted to make is that especially because of covid and you know things basically shifting online for you know, up to two years now is that the teachers and administrators have become more and more glaringly aware of the extreme dysfunction with the system. And, you know, in a way that's a good thing because I think it's become even more obvious how the time is right for this kind of thing for Swami system. And I always felt ever since reading his book, it was the only system that made sense for education. And I think the pandemic has really pushed this along, opening <laughs> more people's eyes to the fact that is this breaking that the old model yeah, so just yeah, does not work they're, anymore. Voice is breaking up. They're breaking just up, Sophia. So yeah. you'll probably have to go off <laughs> so video. The right? time is right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, so I say, Himma, do we want to take one last question? Yeah, I, I just point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Guru, how are you? I, I just wanted to suggest uh, it's such a wonderful concept. And uh, I am a father to a 13-year-old uh, uh, son. You know, what I've experienced is that during these COVID times with all this uh, education system going online, I think they're missing out on a lot of, lot of things, a lot of these values, a lot of this you know, the self-realization that they will undergo with this EFL program in place. Uh, so I suggest, you know, I, I strongly suggest that if you could have a parallel school in place, obviously the ideal scenario would be that we stand, we have standalone schools which have this as part of the curriculum. So obviously that that's the, that's exactly where we are headed towards and that's exactly where our energy should be concentrated. But if in case in, in the interim, if you could have schools uh, or probably evening classes or probably weekend classes for kids, uh, you know, preschools, mid schools, senior schools, and, and probably, you know, like, like how it all happened was that, uh, uh, like for my Kriya Ban initiation also, it happened online. And then it just kept on opening doors and, you know, it just kept on opening opportunities as if, you know, it was master's grace flowing in through you know, so many other uh, avenues started opening up, you know, so one really got to see a part of life, which is not was was not visible to us before this. So I'm mm -hmm. sure this is again happening with a lot of kids. They don't I'm I, I probably, you know, I am in the intermediate because I've seen 
this part of uh, I've just been introduced to this part of life, and I've already seen the uh, the uh, the former life. So I can see the interim, and I can see the crossover where it happens. And I would really want, if in case we could be, you know, if I could seek your help, and we can start introducing it for our kids as uh, these uh, online classes to start off with, and and I think we can just ramp it up from there. Well, interestingly, Himat, stay tuned in the coming month or so, coming month or two. Okay. We have we have one of our one of our uh, young teachers. Uh, is uh, in the, she's a uh, Indian young lady, and she's starting a program with his part of she works with the EFL School in America. She's starting a program called Healthy Teenagers. Is it? I believe it is. I can't remember the, if that's the right title. Uh, do you remember Aditya? Healthy Teens. Anyway, it's basically inspired teenagers. Inspired, inspired, inspired teenagers. She, she, this is a parallel program, I, and I caught that word that you were mentioning. To, it's supplementary educational opportunities aimed at teenagers, mm -hmm. which he hopes to launch within the next, by, between now and the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep in touch, keep in touch with the EFL uh, staff there that is in the chat section there, oh. and and remember that word, uh, inspired teenagers, and bring that up. And you, when it starts to launch, uh, uh, perhaps there's something there that'll be useful along the lines that you're asking about. Sure. I'll just add quickly that um, in the chat, you'll also see a number of uh, details about some programs for younger children that are being started at the Pune School. Um, from 6 to 11 and 12 to 16. Um, so that's also there. And, and I think, you know, I think these are going to be expanding. Uh, there's also some uh, energy to start uh, some similar things here in Mumbai. Uh, so I think this is going to actually be a major uh, part of our outreach because it gives, this was actually the point of the middle school class I was talking about earlier was to give students an understanding of what it might be like to be at an EFL school. Um, particularly because, of course, we don't, you know, necessarily let a young child make large life de decisions, such as which school will I go to, but their opinion is important. And as they get older, especially as they get into secondary and, you know, high school like that, giving them the option to sort of experience something and choose for themselves is very empowering. It's actually one of the most EFL-esque things you can do for a, a growing teenager is to have them be a part of the decision process that's going to, to shape their lives. And so giving them these experiences so that they can say, oh, I like how I feel here. I'm learning, but I also like what's happening. I like that I'm learning about myself as well. Um, at all ages is a powerful, powerful experience. And one of the things we see, just there was one thought way at the beginning in Jaya, your question about parents. One of the things we see is parents often they start their first year with the child very hesitantly. You know, they they're there. There's a lot of trepidation. Is this, you know, going to put them in the wrong trajectory? Are they going to fall behind academically? And usually within the first week, we start to hear, oh, my God, my child is completely different. They come home happy from school. They come home laughing. And these are the kinds of things we want to be able to see, because when you're joyful, you learn. And so it, those supplemental programs will even, in fact, help in the regular schooling, because a happier child learns more. A child who knows, you know, has a bigger perspective on life will automatically be calmer. And the science is clear. We cannot learn in a fear state. When our brain is experiencing fear, new information does not absorb. And when we're worried about tests, when we're worried about pressure, we're worried about all these things, it doesn't work. So if they're being given these, you might call them life skills, supplemental, suppo, supplementarily, uh, I think that's, that's a beautiful idea. You know, the challenge is that we, most of us have not, you know, in the current scheme of things, we've not seen this chapter of this book of life. We've not seen the other side of it. You know, once one, one, it was when I got into self-realization and uh, the YSS and the Ananda Sangha program is when I realized that this is what life is. Before that, life was life had an absolutely different meaning for me. And, you know, one actually got aware of what life is once one stepped into it. 
So just about opening that book and reading that first chapter, I think. It's a work in progress. And this is something that we have a role to play in society at large to help instill these values into the society, into the educational system. So it's not going to be fulfilled in our lifetime, but it's we can certainly make a start and set into motion things that will have an impact, an immediate impact on us, but also impacting uh, our neighborhood and our others and our society. It will. And it's in the fact that we do that, in a sense, we find that we become an instrument for making that change that we all want to see. I want to mention, too, that, uh, you know, at Ananda Village, I mentioned Nitai Durenja, who was the you might say the first inaugural teacher who got the physical school started through, through tireless effort. And uh, he's written a number of different books. And you mentioned teens. And there's a book that he wrote here, For Goodness Sake, by, and the subtitle is Supporting Children and Teens in Discovering Life's Highest Values. And if you have teenagers and kids that are coming up to the preteen years, it might be something you'd be interested in reading. And this is available, I believe, through Ananda Publications. And you can contact uh, Blazy and Aditya and the others there to find out how to get a copy of it, uh, for goodness sake. That is, just to add, that book is, of course, excellent, but it's also extremely practical. It gives activities, it gives concrete approaches that you can take. And I, from a personal experience, I, I taught at the teenage level. That was my, I didn't choose it, it chose me, but I really loved it. But it was also because these tools, it, it's often considered the most difficult uh, age to, to parent uh, in, but it doesn't have to be. It can actually be very fruitful, very idealistic. It's where you see the child become an adult and it's a beautiful time. So I do recommend that book and there's other books being shared as well for children that Ananda Publications has made. I Come From Joy is excellent. Um, and uh, of course, EFL. So I encourage you to look at all of those. Thank you so much, Jayaji, RA1. Uh, we would have loved for this conversation to continue, but uh, what we'll do is we'll, this you might say is one of the many conversations that we're gonna have. There were questions about the school, about the books, about the curriculum. Uh, how can we perhaps get some experience of uh, education for life system while our kids can be in the same school where they are right now. So parents can be more at ease to make the uh, that transition perhaps in the months and years to come. So for that, we'll be addressing these, uh, as I said, in more conversations. The links for the books will also be put on Facebook. So after this meeting ends, you could go there or simply anandapublications.com. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank Arevan, Jayaji, and all the teachers in the Education for Life system, especially here in India, who are trying to you know, do their best online and offline and through after school programs to take these teachings out to parents and to more and more children. So with that, um, we come to the close for today's interaction and satsang, and we look forward to your participation. One final thing, friends, in the information that Prisha has provided, you can join the parents group. There are different groups, uh, WhatsApp groups, um, and you can be on the email uh, newsletter for Education for Life um, activities in India. So please stay in touch for more programs that will be coming. Thank you. Have a blessed weekend. Thank you, everybody. It was a wonderful. Thank this you. was this was very fun, and thank you, Ari Vaughn. We had a nice conversation. <laughs> thank you, Jaya. Thank you, Aditya and Blazy. Thank you, everyone. It was a blast. <laughs>